Gresham College presents This Ain't the Shop for Justice Crime in Dickens, London by Dr Tony Williams Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The quotation which I've included as part of the title for this talk comes from chapter 43 of Dickens's novel Oliver Twist, first published in monthly instalments in Bentley's Miscellany between February 1837 and April 1839. The character who's given the words is Jack Dawkins, more famously known as the Artful Dodger, a foremost member of Fagin's gang of young criminals, and he makes the statement on the occasion of his trial for the theft of a silver snuffbox. Dickens makes this, the Dodger's final appearance in the novel, into a bravura performance. It was indeed Mr Dawkins, who, shuffling into the office with the big coat sleeves tucked up as usual, his left hand in his pocket and his hat in his right hand, preceded the jailer with a rolling gait altogether indescribable and, taking his place in the dock, requested in an audible voice to know what he was placed in that air disgraceful situation for. "'Hold your tongue, will you?' said the jailer. "'I'm an Englishman, ain't I?' rejoined the Dodger. Where are my privileges? <laughs> You'll get your privileges soon enough, retorted the jailer, and Pepper with them. We'll see what the Secretary of State for the Home Affairs has got to say to the Beaks if I don't, replied Mr Dawkins. Now then, what is this here business? I shall thank the magistrates to dispose of this here little affair, and not to keep me while they read the paper, for I've got an appointment with a gentleman in the city, and as I'm a man of my word and very punctual in business matters, he'll go away if I ain't there to my time, and then perhaps there won't be an action for damage against them as kept me away. Oh, no, certainly not. <laughs> At this point, the Dodger, with a show of being very particular with a view to proceedings to be had thereafter, desired the jailer to communicate the names of them two files as was on the bench, which so tickled the spectators that they laughed almost as heartily as Charlie Bates could have done if he'd heard the request. Silence there, cried the jailer. What is this, inquired one of the magistrates. A pickpocket in case, your worship. Has the boy ever been here before? He ought to have been, many times, replied the jailer. He's been pretty well everywhere else. I know him well, your worship. Oh, you knows me, do you? cried the artful, making a note of the statement. Weary good. That's a case of defamation of character anyway. <laughs> Here there was another laugh and another cry of silence. Now then, where are the witnesses, said the clerk. Ah, oh, that's right, added the dodger. Where are they? I should like to see them. The wish was immediately gratified. For a policeman stepped forward who had seen the prisoner attempt the pocket of an unknown gentleman in a crowd and indeed take a handkerchief therefrom, which, being a very old one, he deliberately put back again, <laughs> after trying it on his own countenance. For this reason, he took the Dodger into custody as soon as he could get near him, and the said Dodger, being searched, had upon his person a silver snuff-box, with the owner's name engraved upon the lid. This gentleman had been discovered on reference to the court guide, and being then and there present swore that the snuff-box was his and that he had missed it on the previous day, the moment he had disengaged himself from the crowd before referred to. He had also remarked a young gentleman in the throng, particularly active in making his way about, and that young gentleman was the prisoner before him. "'Have you anything to say to ask this witness, boy?' said the magistrate. I wouldn't abase myself by descending to hold no conversation with him, replied the Dodger. <laughs> Have you anything to say at all? Do you hear his worship ask if you've anything to say, inquired the jailer, nudging the silent Dodger with his elbow. I beg your pardon, said the Dodger with an air of abstraction. Did you redress yourself to me, my man? <laughs> I'm... Never see such an out-and-out -out young wagabond, your worship, observed the officer with a grin. Do you mean to say anything, you young shaver? No, replied the Dodger. Not here, for this ain't the shop for justice. <laughs> Besides which, 
My attorney is a breakfast in this morning with the Vice President of the House of Commons. But I shall have something to say elsewhere, and so will he. And so will a very numerous and spectable circle of acquaintances who make them beaks wish they'd never been born, or that they'd got their footmen to hang them up to their own pegs before they let them come out this morning to try it on upon me. I'll... There, he's fully committed, interposed the clerk. Take him away. Come on, said the jailer. Oh, I'll come on, replied the dodger, brushing his hat with the palm of his hand. Ah, oh, it's no use, you're looking frightened. I won't show you no mercy, not a apeth of it. You'll pay for this, my fine fellas. I wouldn't be you for something. <laughs> I wouldn't go free now if you was to fall down on your knees and ask me. Here, carry me off to prison. Take me away. With these last words, the Dodger suffered himself to be led off by the collar, threatening till he got into the yard to make a parliamentary business of it, and then grinning in the officer's face with great glee and self-approval. Well, Dickens had foreshadowed this scene in an earlier essay, originally called The Old Bailey, published in 1834, and retitled Criminal Courts when it appeared in Sketches by Boz in 1837. In it, Dickens covers a range of material and attests to the indescribable feeling of curiosity which attends anything to do with crime, criminals and the law. Some parts of the essay are very dark indeed. And then he provides the final scene of the trial of a juvenile offender who, as the Dodger is later to do, challenges the authority of the court by insisting on his innocence and blaming the fact of his getting into trouble on his having a twin brother which has wrongfully got into trouble and which is so exactly like me that no one ever knows the difference between us. <laughs> Humour aside, um, this is a reminder of the plight of young offenders in the early 19th century. He is, we are told, a boy of 13, tried for picking pockets and is sentenced to seven years' transportation. As we might expect from a collection of essays illustrative of life in the metropolis, Sketches by Boz includes other treatments of crime. There's an essay called The Prisoner's Van and another describing a visit to Newgate. This last includes an account of the structure and layout of the prison and a terrifying insight into the workings of the mind of a man in the condemned cell as he imagines being able to escape his inevitable fate. The night is dark and cold, the gates have been left open, and in an instant he is in the street, flying from the scene of his imprisonment like the wind. The streets are cleared, the open fields are gained, and the broad, wide country lies before him. Onward he dashes in the midst of darkness over hedge and ditch, through mud and pool, bounding from spot to spot with a speed and lightness astonishing, even to himself. At length he pauses. He must be safe from pursuit now. He will stretch himself on that bank and sleep till sunrise. A period of unconsciousness succeeds. He wakes, cold and wretched. The dull grey light of morning is stealing into the cell and falls upon the form of the attendant turnkey. Confused by his dreams, he starts from his uneasy bed in momentary uncertainty. It is but momentary. Every object in the narrow cell is too frightfully real to admit of doubt or mistake. He is the condemned felon again, guilty and despairing. And in two hours more, he will be dead. This essay also presents three other condemned men. Robert Swan, a guardsman who was convicted of robbery with menaces, and was waiting for his execution, but had his, sentence, his death sentence commuted to life imprisonment. And also John Smith and John Pratt, who were the last men in England to be executed for homosexual practices on the 27th of November, 1835, 22 days after Dickens had made the visit to Newgate which he describes in the essay. 
It was late in 1822 that the Dickenses moved to London, another work-induced transfer for John Dickens. Charles was 10 years old, removed from the school which had been blissful for him, and the family took up lodgings in Bayham Street in Camden Town. So Dickens arrived in London in 1822, an intelligent, observant, imaginative and sensitive and therefore very vulnerable 10-year-old. He was not to return for formal education for almost two years. And taking into account Dickens's frequent visiting, working and staying in London once he'd moved to Gads Hill from 1860, it is true to say that Dickens and London is a relationship lasting from 1822 to 1870, a period of 48 years, almost half a century. And he rests in Westminster Abbey. To speak of Dickens's London, therefore, as if it was one constant thing, is misleading, since his experience of it extended through a period of enormous change, with the Regency city of the 1820s turning into the modern city of the later 19th century. George IV was succeeded by William IV in 1830, and he then, in June 1837, by Victoria. What we witness when we read Dickens is very much the growth and development of the modern city with all its associated problems. Tracing that growth shows us how his attitudes developed, and the city, far from being a background or setting for the events and characters he creates, becomes a central presence, a character in the novels in its own right. The first thing that we should note is the expansion of population of London. It was a city of just under a million at the beginning of the 19th century, increasing to a million and a half by the 1820s when the Dickenses moved there. By the mid-century, the year of the Great Exhibition, it had increased to two and a half million, and by the early 1870s was heading for three and a half million. It more than doubled its population, therefore, during the, whole, the almost half a century Dickens was intimately linked with it. And for all the horrors we know to be true of infant mortality and outbreaks of cholera in the 19th century, the general demographic trend was for an increase in births greater than that of deaths. But a very large part of the population increase was due to migration from other parts of England, other parts of the United Kingdom, especially Ireland in the hungry 40s, and from Europe. The Dickens family themselves were one such group of migrants coming up from Kent. Um, and it's interesting to note how often Dickens returns to the idea of characters entering London for the first time. One other significant change which happened in London during Dickens's time was the establishment of the Metropolitan Police Force in 1829, seven years after his arrival. Later, in 1842, the detective police was established and Dickens's interest in the way the force operated and especially his friendship with and admiration of Inspector Charles Field, led to his making nocturnal explorations of the city in company with Field and his officers visiting dens of vice and crime. I want to return to Inspector Field later. Dickens's depiction of crime draws special force and power from his own experiences, particularly those as a child, when he was sent out to work at the age of 11 or 12, living in lodgings in Camden Town whilst his family were in the Marshalsea Prison in 1824 as a result of his father's debts. This was not generally known until Forster's life of Charles Dickens appeared um, after 1870, but the intensity of the experience made a powerful impact on the young Charles Dickens' personality. Dickens writes, recalling those days of agony, shame, misery and hopelessness, of seeing his future only as a little robber, or a little vagabond. It was a period when he spent much time wandering the streets of London, seeing things which appalled and yet fascinated him. The sights which he saw in those rookeries, uh, in St Giles or at Seven Dials, led him later to exclaim, what wild visions of prodigies of wickedness, want and beggary arose in my mind out of that place. It was his biographer, John Forster, who identified the power of the attraction of repulsion, which drew Dickens to the dark side of life, especially life in London. At another point in Sketches by Boz, in, in the essay A Visit to Newgate, an exploration of the unknown for most of his readers, he stresses the approach that he's taking. 
We do not intend to fatigue the reader with any statistical accounts of the prison. They will be found at length in numerous reports of numerous committees and a variety of authorities of equal weight. We took no notes, made no memoranda, measured none of the yards, ascertained the exact number of inches in no particular room, are unable even to report of how many apartments the jail is composed. We saw the prison, and we saw the prisoners. And what we did see, and what we thought, we will tell at once in our own way. What we get from him is not a statistical report, nor totally invented fiction, but a reality which is intensified by the vision of the creative artist. Thus, when we use the term Dickens's London, we remind ourselves that this is not an invented fictional city which exists only in the pages of Dickens's writing, but it's a place which draws very powerfully on the reality of the world around him. It is one of the ways in which he discharges his role, as Walter Badgett put it in 1858, of being a special correspondent for posterity. What I'm suggesting is that in dealing with crime in London, Dickens brings the skills of a creative genius to the depiction of a reality with which he was intimately and personally involved and which carried deep personal resonances for him. I'm also suggesting that he's opening up for his readers an awareness of places and social levels of which they were unaware and which sit uncomfortably alongside contemporary complacency and self-congratulation. He's also doing this from a very early stage of his career, but with a darkening vision as time went on. One can never go very far in Dickens's output without encountering prisons. The Fleet, the King's Bench, the Marshalsea, Newgate, and his near neighbour when living in Doughty Street, the Middlesex House of Correction, or Cold Bath Fields Prison. Prisons haunt his consciousness as they haunted the consciousness of the criminal inhabitants of London's underworld. He gives us juvenile crime in Oliver Twist, a world of pickpockets, burglars, cracksmen, fences, prostitutes and eventually murderers. Oliver Twist is a rich scene to mine for this theme and I want to return to it. But we also get devious financial operations almost everywhere in the novels. Bank theft in hard times, embezzlement, forgery, massive large-scale fraud in Myrtle in Little Dorrit, and the Anglo-Bengali disinterested loan and life assurance company in Martin Chuzzlewit. These are high-profile frauds where the underworld kind of takes over the rest of the world. There's transportation in Great Expectations. There are the opium dens in Edwin Drood where there's another murder, if it's a murder. There is death by duelling in Nicholas Nickleby and lots more dodgy finance and gambling. There's grave robbing in A Tale of Two Cities and robbery from bodies found in the Thames in Our Mutual Friend. And that novel in particular creates a riverside underworld of great impact and vividness with characters like Rogue Riderhood and Gaffer Hexham. It would therefore be possible to read Dickens simply for his creation of criminal underworlds and create a total vision simply from the range of material in the fiction. It would be a world where some criminals are recognisable. You look at Bill Sykes or you look at Magwitch, you know they're criminals. Or where they're not, like Myrtle or Compison. It would therefore be a world which asks us to review our moral certainties, just as Rogue Riderhood does when he asserts that one cannot rob a dead man. It would be a world which seems to function on a financial basis of great uncertainty, where cheating and exploitation, gambling and forgery seem to control things. It would be, to borrow Dickens' own phrase from our mutual friend, a dismal swamp. The forces of law and order, the vast array of lawyers, some of them equally dubious, the prison and the gallows, exist in this world to provide control and punishment. Oliver Twist was Dickens' second novel, and it offers a complete contrast to the England of Pickwick Papers, which had presented a predominantly bright and sunny picture, though it does, of course, have its own prison sequence. Oliver Twist presents a dark and sinister world. It was Dickens' first novel for the reign of the new young Queen Victoria. And the world it presents is terrifying. 
It exploits melodramatic techniques by creating a concealed identity for Oliver and setting everything right at the end. But the real power of the novel must lie in its creation of the criminal underworld, which seems to occupy almost all of London. Fagin has lairs everywhere, broken down, rotting houses, offering capacity for concealment. And he moves around the city like some strange, disembodied force, and his influence is all-pervasive. Good characters in that novel live out of the city, like Mr Brownlow in Pentonville, then a middle-class suburb, or the Maleys out at Chertsey. The city becomes the criminal underworld. Field Lane, Whitechapel, Spitalfields, Besnell Green, Jacob's Island, all identifiable locations. When Oliver is brought into the city, he's guided by the artful Dodger through the twists and turns of labyrinthine ways. The Dodger's knowledge is necessary for him to be able to evade anyone who might be observing him. At the end of this journey is Field Lane and Fagin. When Oliver is rescued from the police court by Mr Brownlow, he's taken back by a similar route. One turning right or wrong is enough to plunge the unwary traveller back into the underworld, as happens when Oliver takes a wrong turning and is recaptured by Sykes and Nancy. It's a novel which provides plenty of underworld creation through description. The London of this novel has this evil disease at its heart, which seems to be destroying it from within. And it's a world created by language, the underworld slang the characters use, and which gained Dickens quite a considerable reputation as Regius Professor of Slang. It's also a novel which explores the plight of people trapped in that world of crime. People like Nancy drawn into a life of crime from which she's unable to extricate herself. Dickens gives her these words when she speaks to Rose Maley in chapter 40. When ladies as young and good and beautiful as you are, replied the girl steadily, give away your hearts, love will carry you all lengths, even such as you who have home, friends, other admirers, everything to fill them. When such as I, who have no certain roof but the coffin lid, and no friend in sickness or death but the hospital nurse, set our rotten hearts on any man and let him fill the place that has been a blank through all our wretched lives. Who can hope to cure us? Pity us, lady. Pity us for having only one feeling of the woman left and for having that turned by a heavy judgment from a comfort and a pride into a new means of violence and suffering. Oliver's descent into the underworld is close to that to which, which Dickens feared was to be his own fate, as a little robber or a little vagabond, and it's this which lends the novel particular power. Oliver is saved, as was Dickens. Many were not. Dickens's purposes in Oliver Twist are set out in the preface he wrote for the 1841 edition and show us a novelist early in his career combining creative fiction with a strong social purpose and insisting on the reality of what he's doing in trying to remove any trace of romance or excitement attaching to a life of crime. What we have with Dickens, though, is more than the novels. He was a journalist, and particularly in Household Words in the 1850s and its successor all the year round in the 1860s, made other forays into the underworld. The Dickens Journal's online project, based at the University of Buckingham, has made the contents of those journals and other allied publications available on the internet at no cost and accessible to all levels of user. It also offers an analysis of the contents of the journals and identifies some 474 different articles in some way or other connected with crime and associated topics. Some of these are instalments of serial fiction, with strong interests in criminal activity, like Great Expectations. But most are articles on aspects of crime and punishment. 71 of these articles are also identified as being by Dickens himself, or in cooperation with other writers. And some of them took their inspiration from actual cases, like that of the poisoner William Palmer, which inspired Dickens to write The Demeanour of Murderers as a reaction to newspaper reports of the time which had praised Palmer's composure at his trial. Or there was pet prisoners attacking the system of solitary confinement which had been introduced into the new model prison at Pentonville. 
There was an accompanying factual digest published monthly between April 1850 and December 1855 called The Household Narrative of Current Events. And one of the regular monthly categories included was law and crime. And it provided a list of accounts of arrests and crimes, cases brought to trial, punishments meted out. Well, all of that shows us Dickens, the journalist, drawing his social concerns to the forefront, exploring the dark places, making his audience aware as a preliminary to arguing for change. But change, as Dickens knew, was often a slow thing to achieve. And there was a need for more immediate attention to such problems, and that came in the form of policing and controlling. Dickens' lifetime saw the establishment of a police force in the metropolis, uh, in 1829 and then extended it to the boroughs in 1831 and counties in 1839, the creation of the detective force in 1842 and the institution of police inspection from 1856. And that's all a far cry from the Bow Street Runners as we see them presented in Blathers and Duff in Oliver Twist. Charles Field had joined the newly established police in 1829, became an inspector in 1833, and chief of the detective department in 1846. In the earlier stages of career, Charles Field had been an actor, um, which is in lots of ways quite a good thing for somebody who's going into detective work. He and Dickens established a friendship, and he accompanied Dickens on a number of nocturnal tours through the worst of the criminal areas of London. And it was on one of these, an early one in 1839, that Dickens, John Forster, and Daniel MacLeese, the, the painter, were on one such excursion when there was a brawl and the gentlemen had to be got away fast before they got picked up. On another such visit, Longfellow was of the party. And those nightly visits were called by Dickens his field days. Field is thought to have been in part uh, of the inspiration behind Inspector Bucket in Bleak House, one of, one of the earliest fictional detectives. Well, there are several articles in the journalism describing the work of the detective police and its encounters with crime. Um, a detective police party, down with the tide. But the one I want to look at is called On Duty with Inspector Field and was published in Household Words on the 14th of June, 1851. In this piece, the London underworld is explored from St Giles, um, recently in 1847, cut through by the building of New Oxford Street, about which Dickens had a lot to say and Rat's Castle in Diet Street, a gathering place for criminals, and then across the Thames to the Old Mint in the Borough, another one, then back to the Ratcliffe Highway, then to Whitechapel, and finally to Hoban. In all of these places, Field rules supreme. He can find his way around, identify those who engage in criminal acts. All those he meets seek to keep on the right side of him. Anyone so foolish as to set themselves in opposition to him cannot expect support from their fellows. It's a piece of writing which asserts the power and success of Field and those like him in keeping crime under control, keeping the underworld down. And in that sense, it would have been reassuring to readers. Inspector Field is the bustling speaker. Inspector Field's eye is the roving eye that searches every corner of the cellar as he talks. Inspector Field's hand is the well-known hand that has collared half the people here and motioned their brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, male and female friends inexorably to New South Wales. Yet Inspector Field stands in this den, the sultan of the place. Every thief here cowers before him, like a schoolboy before his schoolmaster. All watch him, all answer when addressed, all laugh at his jokes, all seek to propitiate him. This cellar company alone, to say nothing of the crowd surrounding the entrance from the street above and making the steps shine with eyes. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's Dickie, then. making the steps shine with eyes is strong enough to murder us all and willing enough to do it. But let Inspector Field have a mind to pick out one thief here and take him. Let him produce that ghostly truncheon from his pocket and say with his business air, my lad, I want you. 
and all Rat's castle shall be stricken with paralysis and not a finger move against him as he fits the handcuffs on. But it's also, being Dickens, disturbing in the vision it offers of the poverty and danger in this still present underworld. The problem might be controlled by improved policing in 1851, but it's still there, and there's no cause for complacency or self-congratulation. Thus we make our new Oxford streets and our other new streets, never heeding, never asking where the wretches whom we clear out crowd. With such scenes at our doors and all the plagues of Egypt tied up with bits of cobweb in kennels so near our homes, we timorously make our nuisance bills and boards of health non-entities and think to keep away the wolves of crime and filth by our electioneering ducking to little vestrymen and our gentlemanly handling of red tape. What I've tried to illustrate through those examples is the consciousness of criminal activity, which is present in Dickens' writing, both in the range of fiction with which we're most familiar and the journalism, which may be less well-known, but which deserves a higher profile. It's not purely invention or fiction, um, but is based on experience, though heightened and intensified in its impact through the quality of the writing the power of the vision behind it. And it's against this background that I'd now like, as a final sort of stage of this talk, to take a single case study of Dickens's involvement with crime and the contribution he made to the development of criminal reform in the 19th century by looking at the case of the Mannings, husband and wife murderers who were executed in 1849. When John Forster mentions the Mannings in his life of Charles Dickens, he's very restrained about it. He just simply gives the fact. We saw the Mannings executed on the walls of Horsemonger Lane Jail. And with the letter which Dickens wrote next day to the Times, descriptive of what we had witnessed on that memorable morning, there began an active agitation against public executions, which never ceased until the salutary change was effected, which has worked so well. Not only did Dickens' response add to an already powerful debate about public execution, but it drew him into expressing a modified response to his former abolitionist position, which in turn led to a disagreement with his friend Douglas Gerald. It also drew out some very vivid and dramatic written responses, once more demonstrating Dickens' status as a special correspondent for posterity. So what I'd like to do is just examine the circumstances of the Manning murder case its narrative and its consequences, and then have a look at Dickens's response to it, and place that in the context of his earlier statements about capital punishment. Marie, or sometimes Maria Manning, was born Marie de Roux in Lausanne, Switzerland, in 1821. She came to England, entered domestic service, um, and later married Frederick George Manning, a publican and a great Western Railway guard, until he lost his job on suspicion of having been involved in a mail train robbery on the 27th of May, 1847. Previous to her marriage to Manning, she'd been close to Patrick O'Connor, who was a gauger in the customs service, and it was a relationship which carried on after the marriage. O'Connor used regularly to visit the couple at their home at 3 Minver Place, Bermondsey, which is now part of Western Street, Bermondsey. Mr. Manning tolerated the friendship, particularly when he learnt that O'Connor had named Mrs. Manning as a beneficiary in his will. <laughs> One such visit by O'Connor took place on the 9th of August 1849, when he was murdered, and his body was buried in quicklime under flagstones in the kitchen, according to a prearranged plan. Mrs. Manning visited O'Connor's lodgings the same day, and the next day repeated her visit in order to steal his money and the documents relating to his investments, valued at several thousand pounds. The police discovered O'Connor's remains on the 17th of August, having been alerted to his disappearance by his relatives and pursued the murderers who'd hastily vacated their home. Manning was soon arrested in the Channel Islands and Mrs. Manning in Edinburgh. The trial took place on the 25th and 26th of October. They were found guilty. They were executed at Horsemonger Lane Jail on the 13th of November, 1849. Beyond the basic facts of the case, there was much to excite public interest. Mrs. Manning's personality was one facet and her nationality was another. She had interrupted the trial proceedings several times with impassioned demands for justice 
and denunciations of the law, such as, there is no law nor justice to be got here, base and degraded England. This ain't the shop for justice. She behaved violently in prison, cursing the officers, and grew her nails long so as to be able to attempt suicide before her execution. The Times described the action as tightly grasping her throat and forcing her nails into the windpipe. The murder had been brutal. O'Connor had been shot and then attacked with a crowbar. In his later confession, Manning had said, I never liked him. <laughs> and I'd beat in his skull with the ripping chisel. It's a crowbar. Something Dickens quotes in his uh, piece of journalism called Pet Prisoners, 27th of April, 1850. It's also worth observing that Manning, at one point in the trial, had the confidence to say that when all that nonsense was over and the thing wound up, he had an idea of establishing himself in the West Indies. That's quoted by Dickens in The Demeanour of Murderers, another essay in Household Words, this time 1856. He claimed that they'd planned the murder six months in advance by preparing the grave in the kitchen, which they concealed with a shutter, and over which O'Connor had walked many times on his visits to his friends. Manning's claim was that it had taken his wife six months to summon up the courage to kill the man. She'd loaded two pistols, shot him with one, and pointed the other at her husband, threatening him if he failed to help her dispose of the body. Mrs Manning never admitted her guilt, each of the accused tried hard to place the responsibility on the other throughout the proceedings. The police had demonstrated considerable skill in their pursuit and capture of the criminals and had also made use of the new technology like railways and electric telegraph communication. In A Detective Police Party, Dickens presents thinly disguised portraits of the detectives who'd been involved in the Manning case and describes their methods. Philip Collins, whose account of the Manning case in his book Dickens and Crime still, for my money, remains the best, 50 years on from its first publication, describes Field's arrest of Mrs Manning, tracked down to her lodging, as reported to the editorial staff of Punch. It's only me, Charlie Field. So just open the door quietly, Maria. Mrs Manning, in particular, had made a striking figure both at the trial and later at her execution. Her volatile temperament and the fact that she was a woman convicted of murder seized the popular imagination, as did her refusal to admit her guilt and her defiance of her accusers. Some 30,000 people crowded the streets with 500 police to control them around Horsemonger Lane Jail to witness the first joint execution of a convicted husband and wife since 1700. Mrs Manning chose to dress impressively in black satin tightly corseted, making a striking picture to the end, and incidentally making black satin an unpopular fashion fabric for some decades afterwards. <laughs> there is a book by Albert Borowitz called The Woman Who Murdered Black Satin, the Bermondsey Horror. The hangman, William Calcraft, notorious for his incompetence and grotesque caperings on the scaffold, because he was very often drunk, appears to have behaved with untypical efficiency on this occasion, and the two convicted murderers were dispatched on the 13th of November, 1849, each of them aged 28. The crowd, according to the Times of 14th of November, did not behave worse than other mobs under similar circumstances have done, and that's all that can be said of them. <laughs> There'd been a good deal of self-satisfied reporting of the case in the press. The woman was a foreigner, both she and her husband were of lowly origins, the newly created detective police had so swiftly and effectively caught them with the aid of new technology. It was another great proof, if such were wanted, that justice in this country pursues its victims with footsteps swift and sure. On the 7th of November 1849, Dickens wrote to John Leach, who had illustrated his works before, perhaps most famously A Christmas Carol, and was a current illustrator for the magazine Punch declining the suggestion that he should accompany Leach to the execution, which was occupying public interest so much. Evidently, he changed his mind, because he wrote to Leach again on the 12th of November, telling him that we have taken the whole of the roof and the back kitchen for the extremely moderate sum of ten guineas or two guineas each. Houses near to the jail were places to get a grandstand view, much like those near international sporting events today are used. 
Horsemonger Lane Jail stood on the site of what is now Newington Gardens in the borough. What is now Harper Street was Horsemonger Lane. The view from the end of Bath Terrace, which exists, modern building now of course, would have been good for the well-to-do onlookers prepared to pay their two or three guineas to enable them to watch with opera glasses levelled. Enterprising occupants of the houses around were doing good business in hiring out seats on their roofs and even issuing printed tickets. Those on ground level were less fortunate. One was pressed to death in the crush and others were injured. The fair-like atmosphere had been building for some days before the execution. In Dickens's party would have been John Leach, whose own creative response to the great moral lesson of Horsemonger Lane Jail, November 13th, appeared the following week in Punch, which held and pronounced very powerful views on the whole issue of capital punishment. Dickens's friend John Forster was also present, and his reactions were graphically described in a letter he wrote to the novelist Sir Edward Buller-Lytton. Forster asserts that everyone ought to undergo the experience of witnessing an execution for his soul's sake. Forster's reaction is deep, powerfully felt. Dickens's reaction was expressed in two letters to the Times. The first published in the newspaper on the day following the execution. These are long letters and uh, a bit too extensive for me to quote, but, um, but I have included them in the transcript of this talk, so uh, you can certainly have a look at them. For Dickens, as for John Leach, the great moral lesson was not that the Mannings had been punished for their crime with the utmost severity of the law, but it was the appalling effect of the theatricalising of the spectacle on those watching it. He might have added also on those willing to pay for admission to grandstand seats to get a better view. The blunting of the human sensitivities, especially as it affected children, who were, lots of whom were in the crowd, struck him with a special power. Subsequent days brought letters in support of his case that executions ought to go inside the prison and not be made the subject of such degrading and horrifying entertainment as he had witnessed. He then declined an invitation to attend a public meeting designed to call for the complete abolition of the death penalty, something which some while previously he had supported. On the 17th of November, he wrote again to the Times, which published his letter on the 19th, explaining his points in more detail. The whole experience clearly had a powerful and long-lasting impact on Dickens. In a letter dated 29th of December that year, 1849, he describes himself feeling almost as if I were living in a city of devils when he reflects on what he saw. I feel at this hour as if I could never go near the place again. In Household Words on the 30th of October, 1852, he published an essay he'd written called Lying Awake, and his reminiscence is vivid and disturbing. The balloon ascents of this last season, they will do to think about while I lie awake, as well as anything else. I must hold them tight, though, for I feel them sliding away, and in their stead are the Mannings, husband and wife, hanging on the top of Horsemonger Lane Jail, in connection with which dismal spectacle I recall this curious fantasy of the mind, that having beheld that execution and having left those two forms dangling on the top of the entrance gateway, the man's a limp, loose suit of clothes as if the man had gone out of them, the woman's a fine shape so elaborately corseted and artfully dressed that it was quite unchanged in its trim appearance as it slowly swung from side to side. I never could, by my uttermost efforts for some weeks, present the outside of that prison to myself, which the terrible impression I had received continually obliged me to do, without presenting it with the two figures still hanging in the morning air. Until strolling past the gloomy place one night when the street was deserted and quiet, and actually seeing that the bodies were not there, my fancy was persuaded, as it were, to take them down and bury them within the precincts of the jail, where they have lain ever since. In terms of the development of Dickens's social agenda, the Manning episode marks a significant change. He had been, back in 1840, to see another execution, that of François-Benjamin Couvoisier. Couvoisier had been tried for the murder of his employer, Lord William Russell, and convicted. Another vast crowd, this time some 40,000, is estimated to have attended the execution, and both Thackeray and Dickens were present. 
both appalled by what they saw. Dickens's earlier views about capital punishment are expressed in a series of letters he wrote in the Daily News, which he was editing in February and March 1846. He advocated the total abolition of the punishment of death. By the time we reach the Manning case in 1849, he's modified that position to one of ending the public execution of that punishment. It was to take a further 19 years for that change to come about, an act to provide for carrying out of capital punishment within prisons, dated 29th of May 1868, appears on the statute books cited as the Capital Punishment Amendment Act, and specifies that judgment of death shall be carried into effect within the walls of the prison in which the offender is confined. Seems to have been no comment from Dickens on the achievement of the aim for which he had argued so strongly and eloquently. The last person to be executed in public was a 27-year-old stevedore called Michael Barrett, who was hanged at Newgate on Sunday the 6th of May 1868. Newgate Jail was demolished to make way for the new Central Criminal Court buildings at the start of the 20th century. Horsemonger Lane Jail was closed in 1878 and demolished the following year. The bell from Horsemonger Lane Jail is now in the nearby church of St George the Martyr in the borough which stands not far from the site of the Marshalsea Prison, so important in the story of Charles Dickens. Well, one cannot go very far in Dickens' work without coming up against murder, other crimes, prisons and punishments. They bulk enormously largely in his imaginative life, as aspects of them bulk large for his life in reality. Mrs Manning makes, possibly, another appearance as... Hortense, the passionate and later murderous French maid uh, in Bleak House. It may also be possible to see elements of her recreated in Madame Therese Defarge in Tale of Two Cities. The horrors of the Courvoisier execution must have had a strong influence on the writing of Barnaby Rudge, coming so soon after and giving such emphasis to the gallows. But it's hard to know where to stop. Jonas Chuzzlewit, Bill Sykes, Bradley Headstone, Rogue Riderhood, and the ever-fascinating uncertainties surrounding John Jasper in Edwin Drood. The attraction of repulsion, which is so much a part of Dickens' psychological makeup, so much a part of everyone's, and of his writing, is a strong element in his return to this horrifying fact in the contemporary penal code. He lived through a period when the number of capital offences was significantly reduced, and when the earlier bloody code was effectively dismantled. His lifetime saw the official ending of transportation in 1868, though it had effectively died out some years before, and the ending of imprisonment for debt in 1869. His involvement in the debate about capital punishment and other matters of penology, a new term first used in America in 1838, show him always as an aware, thoughtful human being with an understanding of the impact of all aspects of life on his fellow citizens and fellow human beings, that his views altered, modified, developed is no surprising thing. What is important is the way in which his writings, both fictional and non-fictional, show him always willing to grapple with burning issues of the day and keep his writing firmly rooted in the context of its times. Thank you. First, thank you for a wonderful, very moving and uh, memorable talk. I have just two brief questions. Uh, uh, Dickens' experience of imprisonment for debt, of course, was very first-hand because his father was imprisoned for debt. Uh, my impression is uh, where he betrays it in uh, the, the life of Mr. McCorber, who was imprisoned for debt. He seems very tolerant of it. Uh, is there any evidence that Dickens himself opposed it? Curious that, because fascinating that it was ended a year before he died. Yeah. Uh, just a second question. Uh, one of Dickens' m many memorable, unforgettable characters is Magwitch, whom you briefly mentioned, yeah. the saintly criminal. Uh, is there a anybody in, in his life who inspired, in Dickens' own encounters, who inspired the character of Magwitch? Thanks. Right. Thank you. Um, imprisonment for debt and Mr. McCorber. Uh, Mr. McCorber very much thought to have lots of features in his character which identify with John Dickens, the um, grand style of speaking, um, the optimism about life. But I think what's interesting about the way Dickens handles the whole imprisonment for debt thing 
is that he can't, at the time of David Copperfield, which is 1849-50, um, he can't bring himself to face it square on because he puts Micawber into the King's Bench prison, which was further down the street, if you like, in the borough, instead of the Marshalsea. He can't face the Marshalsea. His father's still alive. Um, by the time he gets to Little Dorrit, 1855 to 57, he can face it square on. And William Dorrit, who is also you know, partly influenced by the personality of John Dickens, but a lot less attractive a figure than Micawber, is actually placed in the Marshall Sea, and Dickens can, at that point, face it. Um, and he, he writes about the crowding ghosts of many miserable years and, and says it isn't there now and it's, the place is none the worse for it, um, for it not being there. So I think his attitude changes in that way um, towards, towards writing about imprisonment for debt and being able to come up to it and being able to face it. I don't know if that answers your question, actually. Well, okay, you language. Yeah. Sorry, we, we can't take more than one question per person. What about Magwitch? Magwitch, um, I'm always very cautious about the, uh, the, the sort of origins thing. You know, this character is based on that person. Mm -hmm. um, I think what Magwitch represents I mean, is it, it, a very interesting kind of notion, you know, that everybody was saying, this offers a wonderful opportunity. We transport cr criminals, you know, we get rid of our rubbish and moral sewage, we transport them to the other side of the world where they have an opportunity to make a new life because they can come out, do their sentence and come out on a ticket and leave and, and, and you know, be successful. And Dickens is, it seems to me, saying, well, okay, what if they do? And what if they come back? <laughs> because Magwitch does exactly that. He makes good and he comes back. And when you read that, chapter 39 or whatever it is, in, in, in that novel, and, and you get Pip's reaction to the realisation that this is Magwitch coming back and confronting him with it. You can see all of the, the horror that would have been in contemporary society about suddenly having these criminals back on your own doorstep again. Um, is that all right? For, time for another question. There you are. You, I know we have one down the front. While the microphone is coming down, um, just one question I wanted to, to yeah, raise. Yeah. London, as you said, appears almost as a character yeah. in these novels. Yeah. Um, what about the other criminal elements like the law and the law courts, um, the forces of law and order, the so-called you know, philanthropists, people like mm. Mr Bumble? Um, these are people, they're not criminals, but their behaviour by today's standards is highly unethical. Yes. That seems to be a theme right the way through Dickens as well. Yes, I mean, he doesn't like lawyers. Um, <laughs> essentially, he doesn't like lawyers. I mean, it's one of the great ironies about, about the Dickens family story is, is that the, the, the most successful of his children went on to be one of the chief law officers in the country. Henry went on to become um, the uh, common sergeant of England, which is a legal position we don't have anymore, but, we, you know, Lord Chancellor, master of the roles, and the common sergeant were the three top jobs in the law, and Henry went on to be... To be that, so what he would have thought about that, I don't know. Well, um, myself. Madame, you have a question. Um, I, I've just um, read Great Expectations yet again, and I wanted to ask, um, would it have been true um, that Magwitch would have been executed for actually coming back to see how Pip would... Or did Dickens make that up to add to the drama right at the end of the book? Yes and yes. Um, the... The thing had shifted. The, the, it's a timing thing, and I can't quote you the actual dates, but, but by the time, if you work out the time scale of that novel, um, the time Magwitch comes back, it was no longer a capital offence to be a return transport. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, yes, you're absolutely right, it does add to the, the tremendous burden of responsibility which Pip is given. And what I think is one of the most important things about that novel is it's a novel about forgiveness. Mm. And, and Pip has to be able to forgive Magwitch and to absorb that responsibility and look after him, help him, mm. try and say, commit crime himself by trying to get the man out of the country. Mm. So Dickens, you know, he's perfectly at liberty mm. to play around with the facts. 
I'm afraid one of the great traditions of Mondays at 1 is that we finish on the dot on Mondays at 2. However, <laughs> I, I must ask one question which must be in everybody's mind. Which is your favourite Dickens novel? <laughs> which one do you want us to go home and reread? <laughs> well, they're all good, aren't they? Um, you know, I mean, the cop-out answer is the one I'm reading at the moment. <laughs> um, but somebody else has used that. So. Yeah. Um, no, I... For a long time, it was our mutual friend. Um, and then Little Dorrit. But I do think, you know, the one to come back to and the one to start with, really, if, or to restart reading Dickens, you can't do better than Great Expectations. Yeah. I think Great Expectations yeah. is, is, a, is a pretty magnificent piece of work. Well, that really was a, a tour de force. I mean, we've all read Dickens, we've all seen him on TV, which is a damn sight easier than actually rereading the novels. Um, <laughs> but it reminds me rather of those competitions in the paper where you've got to join all the dots together. What we've had today is not only the, this tremendous page-by-page -page knowledge of Dickens and understanding of it, but so much of the background to Dickens as well, which we so often don't actually come across, so I'm extremely grateful for that. I have to say, however, I do have one serious regret, that you didn't give the lecture in costume. This is a wonderful... <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much indeed, most enlightening, and very good evening. Thank you so much. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.